Okay, welcome everybody to my talk, the generic test automation architecture for the test automation days 2020. I'm sad that I cannot be in uh, Utrecht, but the actual situation allows us to give this digital talk. So let's see what I have for you. First, I want to introduce myself. My name is René Rohner. I'm a senior consultant for testing systems, which basically means test automation and test management systems. I'm working for 20 years in the development and QA area. Um, since 2013, I'm a consultant for Imbus. Imbus is a German company that concentrates on software quality and consulting. I'm also a member of the board of Robot Framework Foundation and doing trainings and working as a test automation engineer. So this is enough for me and now I want to start with my talk. And when we talk about architecture, also test automation architecture, we will definitely start at the very bottom at the foundation of each test automation framework. So what is the foundation of our framework? It's definitely the technology we have to use to automate stuff. When we look to our system on the test, we have to think about what interfaces do we want to manipulate, which interfaces do we want to automate, and here uh, the technology that we use for automation is the most important thing. Over the last years or last decades, the tools we have to automate or test have changed. Uh, typically in the past, we had tools that has only one or had only one technology to automate and we could just choose one test automation tool and could get lucky with it. Today we have different situations. We have often a uh, heterogeneity of technologies, which means we have a lot of different technologies in one system. We have, for example, web front ends. We have maybe some mobile devices connecting to our system. We have some APIs. We have database in the back end. Maybe we want to manipulate the back end or any interfaces for third party systems. So today we have to have a more flexible architecture than in the past so we have to deal with this new issues or newer issues so let's have a look how we could solve these issue that we have a lot of technologies that should be under one roof to stay in the metaphor so i want to show you the generic test automation architecture and again we start with the foundation, so we start at the bottom at the technologies. So what I think is very important to have a technology specific for each technical issue. So it makes no sense to try to deal with a GUI test automation tool with some database access. So we need different technologies here. Um, but if we want to integrate multiple technologies into one tool, we need some kind of uh, equal layer where they connected uh, some interface that is same over all these technologies so we could implement libraries that are uh, technology specific but has a common interface to the higher level so that would enable us to access all these technologies from one um, engine the next thing what we could look at if we have decided the technologies that automate our system on the test, we could look at our test specification. If we have a look to our test specification here, we see our test sequences, so the steps we have to follow in a test, we will also see the test data. And I think it's a good idea to have specification as text, that is possible. Um, there is also possibilities to have this as a proprietary format, maybe in a database or XML or whatever. Um, that's depending on the tool. What I think is a best practice to separate the parts of these layers. So, for example, in the test case, we should have the possibility to separate our logic. So the sequence we want to go through our test object and the data which uh, are used in this test sequence. So to enable, for example, data-driven testing, it's often a good idea to separate the real test data from the test specification. So this is the horizontal separation here. On the vertical side, it's also very important, in my opinion, to separate the test specification from the implementation of the test. They are typically dealing with completely different issues. The test specification 
um, should be readable, understandable. The test implementation should be solving issues as good as possible. So I want to separate them, that I have separate test specifications and then implementations of specific technologies. And here I have to often to talk to developers and tell them that maybe only if they have a hammer in their hand, not every problem is a nail. So which means if you have a programming language, you may consider not to use that programming language as a test specification language. Test specification can be multiple stuff. It can not be Java code in JUnit, but honestly, that's not really readable by, by business people. We could have Gherkin style, so behavior-driven development, behavior-driven testing, which is much more readable, but has also its issues. The next possibility, for example, we could also have JavaScript uh, tests like uh, Puppeteers or Cypress, something like this, and um, we could have keyword-driven testing. Honestly, my opinion is a great def uh, development language is definitely not a great test language. Yes, for implementation and solving issues, but not for specifying a test. So from these options here, I would definitely pick behavior-driven testing or keyword-driven testing because these are readable specification languages that are exactly made for test specification and not made for programming. I come to that later again. So let's have a short look to behavior-driven testing. We have this typical given when then style. So I'm describing a behavior of a system. Typically, you will find this as behavior-driven development. But when I have been with my customers and I review their behavior-driven development process, that what was no behavior-driven development, it was behavior-driven testing. So the people do test maybe with Cucumber, maybe with this Gherkin language, but they follow, don't follow the test-driven approach that the developers start writing the tests. They don't do a lot of communication with the, the uh, stakeholders. So behavior-driven development is not just like using Gherkin for specifying tests. In this case, I would just uh, say, let's call this behavior-driven testing and maybe forget the process around it because the behavior-driven testing is exactly that here. I have um, human readable language with some keywords like given, when, then, and I have single test steps like here when I set the password to uh, this specific password. This is a test specification. And the implementation then may be like here, Java code. Um, here, for example, we have this I set password to and then a variable as a decorator for our Java function. And this Java function gets the password here as argument and then does something. For example, send these keys that are in the password to our front end. So this is implementation of a test step and this is test specification. Okay, now we have talked about separating the sequences, the test sequences from our technology implementation. But there is needed something else. We need test execution components. So if we have to look to our testing tool, we will see that we have different components in this tool for different purpose. The test execution, for example, of course, executes the test. So it parses the test specification and creates executable code. That can be done, for example, with Java and JUnit by compiling stuff into bytecode, or that can be done like in Python or JavaScript, just by parsing um, the code and then executing that, um, the connected functions. So this can be this execution component that reads the specification and calls the functions can be triggered by a human, like I click on the start button and my test automation starts, or this specific component is typically triggered by a continuous integration system or other systems that deal with planning of automation. But for test automation or test execution, we need more components. For example, an exception handling. The point is when a test step fails, I don't want that my program shut down or gets any issues. I want to catch this exception, lock it in my protocol, and maybe skip the next steps and jump or skip to the teardown step. So a clean up step that shuts down my test and starts with the next test. So these are parts that are my, I call them exception handling component deals with. 
and as I already mentioned we have logging here as well so for logging that means we are creating logs that are just logging every single step maybe we have logs for machine readable components like XML outputs or something else and we have human readable logs and human readable protocols so protocols I want to hand over a stakeholder that he can or she can understand what is part of my test these components of our architecture can be grouped into different layers these layers can be named so let's start from the top my test sequence my test specification stuff this is part of the test definition layer the test definition layer defines what to execute how my test is specified so here are also the IDE the editor is part of my test definition layer maybe also some other tools like data generators and so on then we have our test execution layer the test execution layer is a generic layer that deals with execution independent of what test is coming in from the top so for every test it executes the test it locks the single steps it does exception handling so this part has to be implemented once it does the parsing from the test definition layer and it calls the execution layer the test steps that has to be executed it also can deal with flow control maybe like uh, conditional executions like an if and else maybe also if an exception happens that we jump to the teardown step then we are dealing with reports and this is a specific layer that is connected to other systems like the continuous integration stuff and at the lowest uh, level we have this so-called system under test adaptation layer this one deals with the technology issues so connects our framework our test automation architecture or solution with my specific system under test and while the higher both layers can be generic and can be just like downloaded from the internet the system under test adaptation layer and the implementation of a specific technology has to be specific for my test object so here's a good idea to select the best technology I can use and then adapt it to my higher level or layers um, so what we do here we are executing the real actions on our system under test we are getting the reactions from our system under test so we are here controlling the point of controls and the point of observations and we are verifying reactions so we are doing doing the assertions so here this is a correct layer where we handle technical issues like database has to be started and so on this should not be done in the test definition layer and I really would like you to recommend not to mix these layer do not try to solve technical issues in this test specification do not try to add logging into test specification I'm now showing you some real code uh, I have seen in, in the field this may disturb you because it's not that what I already told you is the best practice so let's have a short look so what we are doing here we are doing some logging then we go to a login page we set some parameters and log in then we have here a try catch block where we do something we assert an ID or division is an ID and then we do some stuff and this is a real mixer of all three levels let's have a look we have exception handling like this here this try if something goes wrong we go into this the catch block and the catch block says that the success variable is false and if the success variable is false this part here is not executed of course this could be done a little bit smarter but anyhow it's mixing um, responsibilities so the next point is the logging we have a lot of logging here because it looks like the framework that was used here cannot log just the assertion by its own it only has to have these single logging steps and we don't have only the logging steps what we get out for example in our um, in our console we also get some report steps like here we are creating a report and then this looks like we get this as a human readable report later on so if we want to figure out what this thing is testing so what is the test and we cover everything that is not part of the test specification language we end up with 11 lines here 
So 11 of 26 visible lines are part of the test specification. Which means every time I create a test, I add more than 50% of stuff that I could only written once in my execution layer, where I had the try catch stuff, where I had my logging and so on, and have a very short readable test. So let's now, after this introduction of how the theory could look like, go a little bit more into the practical. So we have this test definition, test execution and system under test adaptation layer. And in my opinion, you could use this as a blueprint to analyze your own test automation solution. So you could just check this one and take your tool and see, okay, what part of my tool is the test sequence or the test definition layer? What kind of editors are we using? Um, do we have a hard connection between my test definition layer and my system under test adaptation layer, which would be the case, for example, if I use Java, which means I cannot just exchange one layer. So my opinion, these layers should be definitely only connected loose. So we should have the possibility to um, exchange also one layer. When we now want to select a specific tool for us, for our system under test, again, we start at the bottom and select the technology. It makes no sense to have the most fancy tool with the nicest editor and the nicest language, but it cannot automate my tool. So we start here. Let's have a look to a typical system on the test today. We have some GUIs, maybe some rich GUI, and we have a backend where we have some database. We have could have multiple backend servers here and different front ends. For example, we had also web testing front ends. And when we do web testing, we may consider to do cross browser testing and verify if my system works on all three browsers that are most common in the world and sorry often we had also to deal with internet explorer 11 but just a warning here sometimes depending on your customers cross browser testing may add a lot of effort but without adding a lot of value so on today's technology you may consider just testing it with one browser and then do some exploratory testing with different other browsers could be easier than just automate everything especially the internet explorer so, and when you do web testing, you should also consider to testing the HTTP protocol itself. So using requests to have a GET request, get the correct response, which is much faster than automating a browser. So when we have these uh, technologies we have to deal with, we could write this on our requirements catalog for our next automation tool and then proceed with the next layers. Let's talk about the test definition layer. I already mentioned I'm a big fan of more textual readable test specification than using programming languages. There are program programming languages that could be used for test specification as well. I think they're more to the interpreted languages like JavaScript, Groovy or Python because they can also be fixed on the test environment and just be run again and it would be okay so far. But still, uh, most of them are not made for readability. They are made for easy writing and um, maintaining. So when we think about these both possibilities like keyword-driven testing and behavior-driven testing, we may think about which is best. And depending on in which community you are living, there could be some strong meanings about or some strong opinions about what of these both is the best language because it has advantages and disadvantages. In my opinion, there is no best language. Both languages can be used and ha uh, work hand in hand depending on who in my project use the language. Let's start with the behavior-driven testing. So I was, will give a short introduction into what behavior-driven testing means. It describes the behavior of my system under test under a specific scenario. So for example, the valid user login is my scenario, then it describes what happens under which conditions. It's always made out of three keywords, the given, when, and then. The given block, like here, made out of two test steps can be connected with an AND argument. So which means given a specific precondition is met and another precondition is met. And then I come to my next block. This first block 
is the preconditioned block. So it maybe creates preconditions or it just verifies them that they are existing and otherwise it would not start the test. The next, the when block, are the actions we do to our system on the test. So here, when a user performs an action and the user performs another action, and then we come to the reaction of the system. So here we are verifying our reaction. We would say, then the system shall show some certain behavior, but the system shall not show some other behavior. So the but and the and can be used both in test specification to extend one block, but is typically used for negative um, for negative sentences and and for positive ones. So having this in a concrete real real um, a test, which would be here scenario the successful login of a user of a known user, and we have our test given the car config is open, which is our program, and login page is visible. When I set the username to admin and I set the password to one two three four five six and I execute the login, then the call list shall be visible. This is a test. The good thing, it's good readable and we have everything we know. And the good thing for the developer is like we know before, I could just pick this, I set the password to and implement it directly with code. So it has less overhead from my code to my test specifications, just one step. It could sometimes depending on the framework even be done in the same file but our business owners or business stakeholders can just read this language here without some curly brackets, without semicolon or something like this where they run away. They just need to read the normal text here. So let's have a look to the characteristics of behavior-driven testing. The pros of behavior-driven testing are definitely natural language. We can have understandable language and we kind of force our developers to use the understandable language. We have a low overhead for the developers, so it's just one step ahead of their code. We could have acceptance criteri criteria of our user stories written in this Gherkin format and then if it's so we could use one one to one this wording to write an acceptance test. And we get some living documentation. And for beginners, it helps syntactic completeness. When I say you always have to have a given, a when, and a then, I always define preconditions, actions, and I also define the expected reactions of my system. And in my opinion, this, um, this approach is good for unit testing, for integration testing, or API testing. I'm not a big fan of behavior-driven testing in system or end-to-end -end tests, but I come to this later. The cons of keep of behavior driven testing are they have not very they are not very good for long test steps so if you have a test that is extended than six steps which is often the case on end to end tests or some complex tests it really gets more or less unreadable because the real sentences are too long and um, it's hard to figure out what the real test is doing it's not very good for manual tests and now you think okay maybe why are we talking now about manual tests? Because we're talking about automated testing. But sometimes it happens that an automated test does not work and has to be tested manually. And if it's one of your major regression tests, it is definitely a point you could think about. It's because of the um, typical length of system and end-to-end -end test, behavior-driven testing is not very good for this. I also have a lot of customers that are doing um, complex end-to-end -end tests with a lot of data. Also here we have big issues with behavior-driven testing when it's get very data loaded. And um, one implementation clause like this and the username has been set or something like this has typically a very narrow scope. So the reusability is not as much as with keyword-driven testing. So let's have here a look to a little bit longer test. So Given the car config is open and the user is logged in and the new uh, the user creates a new car and the user selects the base model Rolo and the user selects the engine engine 4 and the user selects the package Gomera and then the extra intelligent lighting system shall be selected automatically and the extra navigation system shall be selected and the total price shall be 15712 euro. So this test it's kind of long, has some data. It's really not a lot of data, but it makes no real fun to read this. 
if we would convert this test to a keyword driven test, it's a lot of easier to read because on the one hand here again we have our separation of logic and data on the right side, which means we can just read the logical sequence and then just have a look which data is used. For example here we have open car config, login user, create a new car, select base model, select engine, select package, verify extra selection, we have for example here two arguments, and verify total price and close browser. This is even 10 steps except of the or compared to the nine of the one before and it's easier to read because we can directly see which car, which engine, what is the price. It can be highlighted differently than on behavior driven testing. This is another example how keyword driven could look like here for example in a test management system test bench. If you have floating text that is hard to read also for humans so you could make keywords out of them. Keywords could have arguments or concrete values. These specific test steps can be made out of other keywords. So one keyword cannot only be directly implemented by code, it can be done by another keyword which has also credentials. And this keyword like here set new credentials can be made out of set username, set password, set repeated password and so on. And all this stuff can be done by more business related users, maybe no programmers, but with some basic knowledge of programming. And at the very bottom, somewhere there we have, again, our keyword is implemented by some code. Another opportunity or another possibility of having keyword driven testing here would be robot framework. In this case, this is the same test written in robot framework syntax. And here we have also these different keyword layers. So for example, our open car config as user is a functional layer keyword, which means it's not telling about anything about how technically that would go, but it's implemented by technical keywords. So like open car config, set username, set password, click login button, and the set username is implemented in this case, for example, by a technology keyword. So this technical thing, set username, is made out of fill text on a specific ID in the browser with an argument the user. And this may be then implemented in some code, in this ca uh, case here, with Python. And uh, here we have Python and Playwright as a technology at the very bottom. So the characteristics of keyword-driven testing are the pros are as well as behavior-driven testing, it's natural language. It's not as easy to read as behavior-driven testing. It's a little bit more similar to code, but it's still very good. It's great for manual tester because as you have seen, the single test steps are imperative. So they are really actions the manual tester can also just follow. And a lot of uh, frameworks also support um, that the keywords may have documentations. Then we have a clear separation in layers, which is good because we can maintain a specific layer or exchange a specific layer as well. So for example, we could have business, functional and technical layer. Compared to behavior driven testing, we have a ri higher reusability because these um, technical layer, for example, has a huge reusability compared to the very, very high functional level. And in my opinion, it's very good for system test and acceptance test, end-to-end -end tests that are on a higher level where you have typically longer use cases um, and so. The cons are we have no documentation. We are documenting the test behavior, but not the behavior of our system on the test. We have typically higher quality requirements because one um, single keyword is used by more than one person. So um, you want to have some building conventions, some naming conventions, you want to have um, maybe some glossary about which words to use because tip, uh, often you have also different people creating the keywords and other people using the keywords, which is not that often in behavior driven testing. It's more abstract wording. You have a greater distance to code, which could be definitely a con when you're talking with developers because they have a higher overhead when they use keyword driven testing as if they use behavior driven testing. And we have a higher code similarity. So this argument plus, uh, so this, this keyword plus arguments is maybe not that comfortable, but for very high level uh, business people. Okay. 
Let's talk about now about the test execution layer. So the test execution layer is something we want to um, connect into our system. So it's very important that our test execution layer could have multiple interfaces. Like we want to trigger this one from a continuous integration. So we need a lot of control from our continuous integration system into our test execution layer. It would be good that we can give uh, filters with it. So not just execute all my tests. I can fr maybe say, okay, execute only the tests that are tagged with a specific environment. I can uh, inject variable values here from my CI system, like some secrets I don't want to store in my test specification and so on. We could also have interest in triggering this stuff from my test management system. And we want to read the reports and show them in our dashboards or in our I don't know, Jira or whatever. So these are some criteria you have to select the test execution layer. And now that we have talked about the technology, the specification, we could go to the real practice and see what tools do fit these needs. And then you go to the market and you will see there is hell of a lot of tools that have different focus different op uh, possibilities. We have some um, GUI automation tools, we have frameworks, embedded tools, some API tools, and we have web testing tools. And the question is, are these all uh, test automation tools or could we maybe group them except of their technologies? And these three groups I will introduce you to are not like standardized names or standardized groups. I think they are just describing what part of tools do we have on our market. So on the one hand, we have our full stack automation tool. Full stack automation tool means from the view of our automation architecture, these tools deliver all or nearly all um, layers of that. For example, Runorex or uh, Eggplant deliver a test designer, test execution engine, and some technologies. Cypress, for example, does not deliver the test definition layer. It defines how the test has to be defined up, but for example, storing and uh, editing tests is not part of Cypress, but the execution layer and also the technology is part of this tool. Then we have our automation technologies like Selenium, REST or Playwright Puppeteers. Um, these tools do not have specific test designers and they even do not have specific runtime engines. They are depending on third-party runtime engines like JUnit, Java, Cucumber or whatever, but they can adopt it easily from the bottom to these technologies. And we have our test automation frameworks. The frameworks itself are typically only the execution layer with a definition of how the test language has to be specified, like in Cucumber, the Gherkin format, and how you can adapt from the bottom from the technology side. Let's have some practical looks into some examples. So RunnerX, for example, is a Windows-based GUI automation tool which has some strong points like good object recognition, they have an open C-sharp API and nice reports. They have also some limitations. For example, they have closed source stuff, typically full, um, the, the, the full stack automation tool are closed source, so I have not a lot of accessibility or access to the different layers. And they are definitely focusing on UI automation. This picture is from runrex.com and we can see some components here. And when we match these components to our architecture, it, very f it fits very well. We have our test definition here with suites and keywords. We have the reports, we have some execution layer, and we have some Runrex automation API, and we have the technologies desktop, web, and mobile. So we could nearly take every automation tool and match it into our layer. Then have a look to a technology like a technology like Selenium. I know Selenium has this Selenium IDE and they have the Selenium execution engine, but this is just a yeah, sidetrack of this technology. The real Selenium technology is just this web driver stuff. So it's a class in different programming languages that enables me to directly access from a programming language a browser. And the browser has a specific web driver that translates the browser specific API into a standardized web driver API. For every browser, we have specific driver and we can connect to uh, from one automation tool to all our browsers. So this is a technology I can then 
adapt to my framework. And as an example of a framework, I would show you here, would like to show you here Robot Framework, because we think Robot Framework is one of the best and versatile and um, more most flexible frameworks on the market. And it's open source. So Robot Framework in this architecture is just this execution engine in the middle. And Robot Framework, of course, defines its so-called test data syntax, which means your test specification has to be written in a specific file format like you have seen it before. Robot Framework takes care about test execution, exception handling, and produces nice logs, and has the possibility to adapt your own test libraries. And there is one thing what's very specific on Robot Framework compared to other technologies. Robot Framework has a very healthy ecosystem that brings more than 300 ready-made libraries. Like you have directly a Selenium library, you have, you have keywords like click button, click element, go to web page, open browser, close browser, page should contain or whatever. So these can be just downloaded from GitHub and directly used and you can start automating with Robot Framework. Some information, Robot Framework can do behavior-driven testing and keyword-driven testing and uh, Robot Framework is completely open source. It's on the market for a while and has a very huge ecosystem. We have something like 15,000 downloads a day uh, from PyPy.org and we have a very great community. We have multiple community channels, but for example, the main channel like Slack has 8,500 uh, nearly members there and it's really growing uh, at the moment. So it's usable out of the box and there is a foundation behind Robot Frameworks, uh, which are companies behind it that pay the development. And the good thing, if you have such a tool that matches really good to this architecture, you can just exchange the uh, technologies here. For example, we could exchange the Selenium-based browser API to a Playwright-based browser API, which is much more versatile for new technologies. But our tests and our specification can just stay as it is because we have a maintenance layer where we can exchange just a few of the keywords. So maybe you have learned something here about this architecture and this is my takeaway. So take this architecture when you are evaluating test automation tools, when you are uh, maybe evaluating your own tool does your own tool fit your needs and which of these specific components do you have on your tool? You can yeah, use this um, as a blueprint for different tools as well. So at this point, I'm ready with my talk and thank you very much and be available now for some live questions.